What's up, United? I hope you're enjoying your Memorial Day weekend, whether you're off to the beach or staying at home. I would love to encourage you to remember why we even have this extended weekend in the first place. You know, Memorial Day weekend is a weekend to celebrate and honor the lives that were lost so that we can enjoy our life. It's a very Christian principle that we live and find life in Christ because he gave his life for us. And so I want to thank those who have served in the military and still are serving in the military uh, for sacrifices that you've made to defend our country. And so thank you. Um, We honor you on this day and remember you and remember the many that have gone before you. Uh, The month of May has also been a month where there's a lot of things that have happened that we've missed and some things that didn't happen that we've missed. For instance, graduation, like graduation parties, graduation celebrations, graduation ceremonies. And yet we haven't forgotten about those things. And graduates, we haven't forgotten about you. And this week, we specifically want to talk about college graduates. And we want to honor and congratulate those college students that have graduated graduated. And in fact, uh, I was able to round up a few of the college students that we've known at Stevenson University uh, just to check in with them to see how they're doing and see what their plans are. So check out this interview with them. Well, hey, United, I wanted to introduce you to some of the seniors that are graduating from college this semester. Uh, This is definitely a horrible time to be a graduate. And I'm really sad uh, because Uh, I have a deep love for all three of these seniors that are on the call, and I've been really sad to not see them uh, in this really monumental moment of their life. Um, But I'm glad to be on a call with you guys. Thanks for making the time to do this and to say hi to the United Church family and to just share briefly what's going on in your life. And so I just had two questions for you guys uh, that I wanted to hear from you on. Uh, you're, You're wrapping up your college career. Love to hear. Uh, just what one learning is or something significant that God has done in your life in these last four years that you're thankful for? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, <clears throat> my name's Mark. I was a film major. Um, and over these last four years, uh, one thing that God's really showed me is just that he will um, make things happen. And I saw that most vividly um, working on my capstone project over the last year and a half. Um, and all the ways that God made things happen that there's no way I could have done, um, from raising money, from making travel plans, from pulling the right people onto the project. It was just really cool to see how all of that came together, and it was really all, it was all God. Cool. Awesome. Tell us real quick about the project, so some people might not know what the Africa Doc is, or where you went, and what you did. Yeah, so I traveled um, with Caring Hands Africa to Cameroon. Um, where I was able to witness kind of the way that they um, are helping people and setting up their mobile clinics. And um, I took a team of two other students um, and we shot a documentary about the work that's being done. Um, And it's kind of shedding light into um, who G is as a person running the organization and what um, the organization is doing. Awesome. Very cool. All right, well, I'm Joseph, I'll go next. Um, So I was a business communication major at Stevenson. Um, And I think one thing that God really taught me was just um, really seeking after my own passion, um, where I found like business communication is just not what I wanna do. um, And it's just really connecting with people. I love just having deep, genuine conversations, one-on-one with people. Um, And I've kind of always known that about myself, but doing a business communication degree, I just wasn't really getting that life. Um, So as many of you know, with my brain tumor, after I came back from that, I just made the heart decision to pursue, you know, my master's in counseling um, and be a therapist and live out that passion. And I think just throughout my um, college years was just slowly finding that with the people around me. So I don't have any clients right now, but I... I have people around me and and my family and my friends and people from United, people from Young Life that I can just reach out to and have those conversations with. So I think that's probably been the main thing that God's taught me. So That's awesome. Thanks, Joseph. How are you, Caitlin? Hi, I'm Caitlin. Um, And I was a nursing major at Stevenson. The biggest thing that God taught me um, was actually early on in my freshman year. Um, I had a lot of trouble 
um, with some friends and some roommates and I was actually uh, found myself in a bullying situation with the people I lived with mm -hmm. and um, what it taught me over the year as I processed that was that um, those were not the people I was supposed to make relationships and friendships with. God was actually trying to um, shut that door for me, but he was opening another door elsewhere. And that's where I really um, met my true friends and um, really flourished through my students and years. And it's really showed me that even though it feels like your world might be crashing down and that your plans are not going the way you think they should, it shows that God is trying to direct you on a slightly different path. He's trying to show you that maybe your plan isn't going to work out because his plan is supposed to be working out. And so following him on the path that he wants you to go on is absolutely the most fulfilling way you can go. So it really taught me to just trust in God and uh, go on his path and see what it leads to because it's, it's going to be so much more fulfilling. Yeah, that's awesome. Reminds me of the proverb, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct your paths. That's awesome. Cool. So, hey guys, tell us what's next for you, like where you're at and where you're, what you're doing in life, uh, what your next steps are after graduation. So I moved home with my parents um, and I plan on being here for at least a year or so. Um, just trying to get my feet underneath me. Uh, I'm currently putting out all the job applications, hoping to find something in the video marketing world. Um, but we'll see. Just very grateful to have uh, a family here where I can kind of hunker down until I get my feet underneath me. Yeah. Awesome. And so home for Mark is Lancaster. Did I say it right? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Awesome. Hey, and just real quick, if you guys don't know, Mark has been with United from the very beginning, uh, doing film, video, using his gifts to serve United. And man, Mark, I already miss you. And um, I'm so thankful for the ways that God has used you to help invest in United Church. And I'm excited to see how he's going to use your gifts, man. You're gifted young man and uh he's got great plans for you thank you okay. um all right well i um have been living home all of my college years i've uh, just been commuting in stevenson um so i'll stay here but in july actually like right away i'm getting right into it i'm going to start my master's at messiah college uh, for clinical mental health counseling um and that's mostly an online degree so i'll still be able to um, be around um, so that's my plan for that. And then kind of same thing for job. I mean, COVID kind of, um, ruined that and messed, messed with that just like pretty much everyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, so not sure what I'm going to do for a job, but, uh, that's my next path is staying here and, and doing my master's. So awesome. Great. Glad you're here. So loving college students stay. So for me, um, finish finals up next week and then I'll be hunkering down. I'm at my parents' house here in South Jersey and um, I'll be studying for my national boards, the NCLEX, and then I'll be an RN and my start date for my new job in Lancaster is uh, July 13th and I'll be working at, um, with Penn Medicine as a trauma neuro intensive care nurse. Um, so I'm currently looking for some apartments either inside or outside the city of Lancaster and just got to get through the next two months and hopefully um, get to that July 13th date sooner than later. Awesome. And you see you representing Penn Medicine too on your shirt there this, this morning. So cool. Awesome. That's great, guys. Thanks so much for taking the time uh, to join us. Can I just pray real quick for you guys? And if you're United family watching, go ahead and just join me in praying a blessing over these guys. God, we thank you so much. Um, for these three seniors and other seniors even that weren't able to be on this call and for the work that you've done in their lives, how you've grown them closer to you during this time and how you're sending them out, God, uh, from their campus, from campus ministry, from United to um, be a missionary in uh, these different career fields and different parts of our country. I just pray, God, that you would provide for them, uh, lead them uh, to gainful employment and employment where uh, they can be led for Christ. And so we just pray this all in Jesus' name um, for these three friends. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, guys. See Thanks, ya. Tim. Thanks, Tim. Bye. Well, congratulations to our college graduates. Uh, we are so excited for you as you move into your next season of life. And high school graduates, we can't wait to talk with you just in a couple of weeks. 
In the month of May, we've been talking about this thing called Regroup, where we're trying to rally everybody who's part of the United Family to jump into a group. I mean, now more than ever, we feel this saying that we've heard in the Bible, it is not good for a man to be alone. And that was said when the world was as it should be. You know, there was no brokenness or sin in the world, and God said it's not good for us to be alone. And now we feel that more than ever in this time of self-isolation and quarantine and so forth. And as we regroup, group, we want to strongly encourage you to be a part of a group because it's not good for you to be alone. Um, and so when we regroup, what we're doing is just kicking off groups again in a new and fresh way. And the way that you should think about, hey, what group should I jump into and be a part of? Because I want to convince you, you should be a part of a group, but maybe you're wondering what group should I be involved in, is by asking you a couple questions. When you think about, hey, I want to go out to dinner this Friday night with a couple of friends and you pick up your phone to text or call somebody, who is that you're calling and texting? That's who you should be in a group with. Maybe you're thinking like, you know, I don't have the opportunity to go out much on a Friday night anymore, but I love to serve in the community. I love to be active in service and volunteering. Well, who's the person that you would say, come along and serve and volunteer with me? That's the person you should be in a group with. So go ahead and text them right now. Talk about what group they're going to be involved in and, and sign up online to be a part of that group together. Uh, you can sign up um, through our online check-in. So we do a check-in every weekend where you check in. You can share a prayer request where United Leaders and small group leaders and staff are praying for these requests. Uh, and you can just say, hey, I want to sign up for this group on that online check-in. You can also go to the group's page to find out more information about those groups. Uh, but definitely sign up for a group this week. Uh, and then what's going to happen in the first week of June is groups will get started online. And I would love to see as many people as possible connecting in those groups, building community, living on mission for Jesus Christ as we regroup. This morning, we've got a special topic that is very needed for us in this time of COVID. And so make sure you have your Bible out and get ready to enjoy and grow in following Jesus. Well, hopefully you have a burger this Memorial Day that is a little less contaminated than the thing you just saw poor Lorian uh, eat. Uh, my name is Jerry Gaffney. I'm one of the pastors here at United Church. I hope you are enjoying your weekend and as best as possible, even in Corona time, uh, enjoying this weekend. So um, I just want to be as real as possible today. And so I'm going to let you a little bit into my world so you can track with me. So uh, a number of months ago, uh, Tim wanted to plan a discussion about how a Christian finds rest. And so, and then it landed here for me to do this message in the middle of coronavirus time. So you can imagine how good of a situation that is for me to preach about and talk about the importance of resting in, in God uh, during coronavirus. So this is a really, really weird time uh, for all of us. Uh, people have had like time on their hands like never, ever before. And, and so 
if you're trying to get through some of this time by binge watching, which is a lot of us, a lot of us, what we're doing, uh, you've been trying to like scarf up everything on Netflix you can get your hands on. And, and so there's only so much Breaking Bad you can watch. There's only so much of The Office thing you can watch. I mean, for goodness sake, uh, Netflix is now going back in time, jumping into a time machine and pulling up Little House on the Prairie and putting that on their uh, programming. Now, some of you younger folks are going, hey, Boomer, uh, what is Little House on the Prairie? And that's part of the joke because they're so desperate to put content up that they're actually going back to 1974 to put shows on Netflix. And so that's how desperate we are. And even for some other people who are not trying to utilize the extra time they have, they might be running around their house, painting every room they can get their hands on. So guys are going into the, the baby's nursery that they should have painted 20 years ago, and they're painting that now. They're working through their honeydew lists and trying to make their wives a little bit happier while they're getting all this stuff done for, uh, for their wife. And, and here's the thing that drives me a little bit crazy. Walking posers. Uh, do you know what a walking poser is? Like, I'm a walking person. I've been walking for a long time. It helps me relax. I love to get outside. I clear my head. I get to pray. And now I'm looking out my window, and I'm seeing these posers walk by. And I'm like, I've never seen you walking in this neighborhood for two years. And now I see you out there walking. And I don't want to besmirch them too much. It's a good thing uh, that people are getting out and exercising. But here, here's the thing. We are trying to cash in on all kinds of extra time these days, and uh, these are some of the ways that people are doing it. Now, now there's another weird dichotomy going on now. There is people that are, are having all this extra time that they're really trying to, to, to do these other things with, and then you have people on the other end of the spectrum who are the busiest they've ever been. So they might be people that are uh, working in the healthcare field and they might have crazy shifts. Uh, they might be nurses or doctors. A lot of us are working from home now. So when we're coming home, we don't know when work life ends and when uh, home life begins. And so there's a weird switch that's not happening with people. And even people in school, like so students or even college students, uh, you're used to going into classrooms for the most part. And now you're struggling like to learn on your own and pace at your own. And so this has been challenging. And so I, I say all this so you can get into my world a little bit and help empathize with me that I got to deliver this message. This doesn't sound like rest to me. Uh, does it sound like rest to you? If you pull up the internet and you start looking at articles, what are things you see? Unemployment is going crazy, shutdowns, lockdowns, stock market volatility. This doesn't sound like rest. Uh, even for me, I'm, I'm what's called a bivocational pastor, and that means that I earn my vocation outside the church. And some of you know that I uh, work in the software industry with hotels and motels. Well, my, my hotels and motels are in South Jersey. And if you've been paying attention to anything on the news, you realize that South Jersey has been like hammered by coronavirus. And so all my clients are trying to figure out if they can open their property and how they'll open their property. And so it's, it's created a challenge for me because I'm wondering like, how in the world am I gonna get paid if none of my clients are actually making money? Now, thank God, like the state's starting to open up a little bit. And so this is the world that we're in right now. And it certainly doesn't feel restful, but I think it might be a time for us to really consider in what, or more importantly, in whom are we finding our rest? So think about that for a second. In what, or more importantly, in whom are we finding our rest? I think today God will point us in the right direction about how to think about this. So if you're trying to understand, like, what is the idea in the Bible about, the re about rest and what does God talk about when, he, when he's talking about rest, you don't get far into the Bible where you see God actually address this. And so literally in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, the second chapter, God talks about this idea of rest. And this is what it says. In Genesis 2, God says this. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. 
because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So check it out. The God of the universe who doesn't need to take a rest, doesn't need to take a nap, doesn't need football day, doesn't need to put his feet up. He is establishing a time where he rests. And not only does he do that, but he establishes in the nation of Israel the concept of a day of rest, and it's called the Sabbath. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So I want to give you a little bit of context here so you understand kind of like what's going on in the Old Testament with this idea called the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is an extremely important Jewish holiday. Um, and it was celebrated on the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday. And actually it was started on Friday night at sundown and would continue on into Saturday night sundown. And God didn't want anybody to do laborious work. And there's also a, pro, uh, a prohibition of creating a fire. They, God didn't want them cooking. And so uh, they would have to do their preparation work before this day. And so during the celebration, women would light candles and husbands would say prayers and there'd be a breaking of bread and they would celebrate the Sabbath meal. And even during this time, there was this kind of idea about remembrance. So this is where God uh, gave them an idea. Like say, hey, I want you to remember. And so we see this in the book, book of Deuteronomy, which is also in the Old Testament. It says this, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now, this day was so important to God that if someone profaned it, it could actually get them killed. It was a capital offense in the Jewish law to profane this day. This is how important God thought it was. And this day reminded the Jewish person that they were a dependent creature on God and that he was the author of life. He was the one who cared for them and he was the one who sustained all things. And it was also a time of joy. They literally were not allowed to express grief or sorrow but it was a time where they could actually celebrate and rejoice. So this is kind of the, the backdrop of what's going on in the Old Testament with the Sabbath day. So, so now we fast forward to our time. And we're talking about uh, us today in the church and people that have started a relationship with Jesus. What are we supposed to do about this day? And, uh, and how does it apply to a person who's placed their faith in Jesus today? So if I'm out mowing my lawn on Sunday, should my wife go Old Testament, Old Testament on me and like stone me for mowing the lawn on Sunday? I hope not. Um, but what is, the, what is the, the Christian supposed to do with this celebration and this idea? So the funny thing is, if you go back and look into the New Testament, and you'd start doing a study on, okay, how did early Christians celebrate the Sabbath or resting? What, what did they do? You're going to find that there's not much information in the New Testament that talks about this day. Now, we do see examples of Paul. Uh, Paul would go into certain towns and he would preach at the local synagogue there and he would talk about Jesus. But there's not much about them making a ritual out of it. There's some idea that, uh, that some Christians kind of did something on the first day of the week, which, which is our Sunday. And, uh, and there was probably some Christians who practiced the Sabbath and then some that didn't. But there's really very little in there as far as prescriptive things that we're supposed to do with the Sabbath. So what are we supposed to do? Um, you've heard this term, the Lord's Day. If, if, if you might have heard this in church circles, oh, I'm going to make sure that we honor the Lord's Day. If you actually look in the Bible, there's one verse that talks about the idea of the Lord's Day. 
And so even though it's kind of a cultural thing that we've gotten into, it, it's, it's, there's just, there's not this, all this evidence about what we're supposed to do. So are we supposed to like never rest? Should we go to church? Um, are we supposed to watch football if it ever comes back again, if we actually have people in stands and things like that? What is it that we're supposed to do? Well, I think in order for us to figure out what we should do, we probably should get an idea on why was God instituting it in the first place, right? God always has a heart to provide and care for his people. So if he wants us to, uh, if he wants us to do something like this, there's a reason why he wants to do it. So what was God getting at about this idea? Well, this is what I think. Rest is about trusting. We need to rest because it puts us in a place of being dependent on God and it strengthens our relationship with God. Rest is about trusting in something or even more importantly, someone. So if you've ever flown on an airplane, you know that a lot of times when people on an airplane, what do they try to do while they're there? They want to take a nap or sleep the whole trip away. And it begs the question, how do you possibly sleep on an airplane? You're flying 30,000 feet in the air. And how are you supposed to rest in the airplane? Well, for me, I'm one of those people that can, you know, I can rest for some of the time on the airplane. And the reason I can rest is because I believe that the pilot actually is knowledgeable and cares about the passengers in the plane. Um, I actually, it's kind of comforting, um, you know, when the pilot, for me, when the pilot gets on, you know, the intercom, he's like, we're flying at 30,000 square feet here. Not, not square feet, but he's, we're flying at 30,000 feet. And, um, and, and I, I kind of get this sense of like, oh, I can, I can trust this person. It, it's calming. And, uh, and, and it helps a little bit that the pilot has a vested interest in flying the plane right. I mean, obviously, if it crashes, he's going to die too. So that's not a good thing. But most of the time, I'm thinking about this guy's a professional. He cares about everybody on the plane. Um, and he wants to get us there safely. That's how come I think a lot of us can sleep on a plane. Uh, I have three children, Debbie and I. Um, when, when they were little, we would shuttle them around in a minivan. And we had an awful red Ford Windstar minivan that I called a red pointed brick. It was awful. I hated this van. I could go on and on about uh, the disdain I had for this vehicle. But it worked for us. And um, I remember t one time I was driving with the kids and the kids are way, way in the back and they're yucking it up and having the time of their lives. And, and I, I yell back to them, hey, are any of you guys worried that I'm going to drive off the road right now? And, and they're all just clowning and they, and they say, you know, no, no, we're not worried about that. And then later on, I asked them, maybe in the ride or when we got back, I said, why, why aren't you worried that like I'm going to like drive off the road? And in their kind of eight-year-old way or whatever, they were saying, well, we know you love us and you wouldn't do that. And in some regard, they were saying, like, that's not in your character to do that. And, and they, even at their young ages, and even though Debbie and I have been flawed parents, they knew that they had parents that loved them and cared about them and wanted what was best for them. And they knew they had a father who gives good gifts to them. And so resting is about trust. And this is why I think God cares about us resting is because he wants us to trust in him. So here's a question for us today. Are you trusting in Jesus with your life? You know, you and I will never be able to really rest the way that God intends us to if we don't completely trust Jesus with our lives and with all the things around us and the people that, we ma that matter the most to us, and, and unless we trust them to God as well. And we, there's no way we're going to do that unless we start a relationship with Jesus. And so the first question I want to ask you is, have you placed your faith in Jesus? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? to take control of your life? If the answer is no, I believe you're never going to feel and experience the rest that God wants you to have 
because you don't have that relationship with Jesus. And I think what ends up happening is we try to anchor our lives into something, something else. I think all of us are trying to find rest somewhere, but we try to anchor our lives and rest in something that's not God. And it rings hollow. I think even for people like Jeff Bezos or Denzel Washington or LeBron James, they got pretty sweet lives probably. Doesn't mean they haven't had pain in their life, but they are one day going to be required. Their life's going to be required of them. And even if they had the most carefree or pain-free or opulent lives, which they still had struggles, they will not find rest unless they've asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins and to follow him. So the first way we're ever going to have rest and experience rest is we have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So if, if we've started a relationship with God and we have a relationship with Jesus, I would ask this question, is your life characterized by rest in him because you trust in him? So when you look at your life or other people look at your life, do they see kind of like what's coming out? Is it characterized by rest and rest in God because you trust in him or is your life characterized by something else? So let's think about Corona again. How about the area of health? Are our lives characterized by trusting Jesus with our health and trusting our kids' lives and our parents' lives and our grandparents' lives, are, 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 when we look at our lives, are they characterized by that we trust God with our health? Or do we believe what we're the ones that ultimately control whether we live or whether we die? Or whether our children live or die, our grandparents or parents, or how they get sick or when they get sick? Jesus is recorded in the book of Matthew and Matthew's account in chapter 10, we see these couple verses. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of, uh, of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So we're talking about like, how do we trust? Are we trusting God with our health? How about our work situations? Right now, I am completely in the wrong industry. Check out this headline here. I don't even need to read this article about these six numbers. I just know that every number in the travel industry is in the toilet right now. It's not good news. And when this started happening, when the corona started spreading all over the place, during like probably week two, I was not doing very well. Uh, I was pretty faithless at that time. I was having a hard time believing how God was going to provide for us. I was having a hard time f figuring out like what's the world going to look like. And, and then I had to get my head back on right. And, and so I started spending more time with God. I started seeking him in his word. I started praying more fervently. And I actually put more time in to thinking about my life and I thought about how over the last 35 years of me being a Christian, how has God come through for me? And he's come through over and over and over again. Uh, rarely on my timetable. Uh, God has like a different timetable than my timetable, but he's always come through. I remember when I first started my software business, uh, I had a great job at another company. We made fine money. Um, we had health benefits. I had a 401k. It was great. I don't know why in the world I was thinking about starting my own thing, but I felt like I should do this. And so when we got started with this business, we were poor. Uh, and we were living month to month. And Unlike in the corporate world, in the corporate world, if you're doing pretty well, you'll probably maintain your job if the company's stable. Um, when you're on your own, it's like every, anything can happen to you. And, um, and the way I got through that is I believe that the God who saved my soul could also and would also save me financially. So we trust God with our souls that when we die, he will take care of us and usher us into heaven. And, and so... In the same regard, I, I thought I can trust God with our money. 
And so Paul writes this in the book of Romans, chapter 8. He says this, and this was helpful as well. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I remember a few days ago, I was praying, I was thinking about the travel industry, and because uh, I had talked to somebody in our family about the travel industry, and I thought about, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen in the travel industry, but I know God's going to take care of me somehow and some way. He always has. How about investments? How about your, your, your financial future, your 401k, your retirement? Are you trusting in that? If you like to check the stock market and you, start, stock market and you see that it's up and down, 1,000 points one day, 500 points down the next day, it's really volatile. And I think we've, our world's been rocked because we realize that it's not, it's not a fully stable deal, our finances either. So our lives characterized by trusting in Jesus and resting in him uh, or are our lives character, characterized more by anxiety, worry, and self-pity, kind of like the unholy trinity of unbelief. These three things are a check engine. It's a check engine light of our soul. Anxiety, worry, and self-pity. They reveal areas where we are not f- fully trusting in God And we should pay attention to them. They're telling us something about what we believe about God and what we believe about ourselves. So if we placed our faith in Jesus and have a relationship with him, if we're learning to trust him and follow him daily, um, should we do this thing called rest? What's it look like to do it? I think we should do it. I think God has set aside a pattern that we could easily see in the Old Testament. It was really important. I think his heart is for us to trust him and rely on him. So to me, it makes sense that we're supposed to take some time off and, and relax and be rejuvenated by God. And so what would, it, what would it look like to do that? Number one, actually stopping and taking time off, like actually stopping your day or taking a day out of your, cal- a day out of your week for your, your calendar and not working. If we work around the clock 24-7, what does it communicate about us? It, it, t- it communicates that we believe that we're the masters of our own universe, that we're the ones that decide whether we're prosperous or not. We're the ones that we're supposed to trust in. And I don't believe that this is what God wants us to walk around with as a worldview, that we're the ones determining our future. I think one of the problems today with, with this whole coronavirus thing and everybody, a lot of people being sent home to work from home, we have this blended life now of work and home life. And I think it's a problem. I think some of us are really, really busy because our bosses are texting us, calling us, emailing us 24-7. We never really know when to turn off work. Well, I think if we're going to actually practice this idea of rest and resting in God, we need to stop at certain times and be done during the day and trust that God's going to take care of whatever else is going on in our lives. Uh, And that might mean turning off our emails, turning off our phones, turning off tech devices, picking a certain time that we finish. I know for me, like dinner time was really important. I realized I needed to be home for Debbie and the kids. And so I made it home for dinner almost all the time. Whatever I was working on just kind of got stopped and I figured out a way to get it done eventually. And God helped me do that. I think if we're in the critical care industry, uh, maybe doctors, nurses, and people like that that are kind of on the front lines of really taking care of people, that's awesome that you're doing that. Uh, you probably need to still have some time, even if it's just a few moments where you're asking God to help you to rest. And more importantly, that you're acknowledging that Jesus is people's savior. Not you, not us, not me. We are not people's saviors. He is the only one that's the savior of people. Even when we're in those critical care industries, he's the great physician and we just kind of come along and help him as little physicians and little doctors and little nurses. I think it makes sense to take a day off out of the week. Um, If you feel like you can't take time off, I think you need to ask yourself why. What's going to happen or what's not going to happen if you start to take time off for rest? So number one, we need to take some time off. Number two, there should be some sense of joy in our lives. We need to know that God's going to come through for us. 
Look, I get it. Coronavirus is terrible. It's awful. It's turned people's lives upside down. I hate reading about it all the time. Uh, and but but having coronavirus or the world being plagued by coronavirus is not the worst thing that could ever happen to us. The worst thing that could happen to any of us is for us to die in our sins and meet a holy God without having our sins atoned for in Jesus Christ. If the whole world falls apart and caves in and gets swallowed up by coronavirus, if we know Jesus as our Savior and we've trusted in him, he's going to usher us into a place of heaven where we're going to experience no pain, no sorrow, perfect relationships, perfect bodies, perfect relationships with God. Uh, it's going to be an awesome thing. And we're going to look back on this time of coronavirus and be like, oh yeah, wasn't that that thing that happened on earth? Oh yeah, yeah, our world was rocked. That's what we're going to be thinking about in heaven when things are fully restored. And so resting people, people that are resting in, in the relationship with Jesus, there should be a sense of joy and, and some sense of, of happiness and enjoying the blessings that we have right now. We can hold on to the fact that we have a sovereign God who holds all things together, who is before all things, and in him all things are held. This is the God that we believe in. Lastly, what should it look like when we're resting? We need to have some time with God. It's hard to trust somebody who you don't know and you don't know well. And it's hard to trust in God and rest in him if you don't know him well. And so how do we know God well? We spend time with him in his word. We start, we, we read his Bible on a regular basis. We're praying on a regular basis. We're trying to connect with people who are going to help spur us on to that. These are the ways that we can grow in this time. And so I would encourage you, uh, don't be tempted to run the clock out with Netflix and, and during Corona time. I don't believe rest is binging is binging TV. These are great opportunities for us to dig into God, follow him, read books, read his word, connect with people in more um, real and deep ways. And I believe that's going to help us to rest in him. So as we finish here uh, today, I would ask you, are you resting in God? Are you practicing that? Are you practicing resting in him? Jesus says in Matthew's account, come to me all you or who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. He wants to give you and I rest, but we have to lay our burdens down. We have to lay our life down and we have to allow him to give us rest. Have a great weekend. We look forward to seeing you next week. Hey United, thanks for joining us again for another online weekend experience. I hope that today helps you find some rest, not just a nap, but rest in God, where you can abide in him and follow Jesus. And that rest gives you strength. It gives you strength to follow Jesus day after day after day. What a really encouraging, helpful message for us to hear. I can't wait to see you next weekend as what we're going to do is close out our Acts series together um, as we move into our new series. And so I'll see you next weekend. Take care.